Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Adrian Miller tōko ingoa, ko Monga Kiki tōko monga. Ko Whangatiao tōko awa, no Tamaki Makaurau aho, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Morena, my name's Adrian Miller and I'm the GM for New Zealand at the Infrastructure Sustainability Council. I'd like to welcome, welcome you to the ISC's International Women's Day webinar 2022, co-hosted with Tonka and Taylor. This panel discussion is being broadcast as part of a broader campaign called Breaking the Bias, Reimagining Infrastructure. We've asked the sector to imagine a world where infrastructure is designed with all in mind, a world where when deciding what, where and how infrastructure is to be delivered, more inclusive views are sought, a world where the demographics of those delivering the infrastructure better represent the communities the infrastructure serves. A world where infrastructure is thought of not just as an asset, but for its human base, as something that connects people and communities and delivers on their aspirations. These are all areas where we feel there is potential for bias to currently operate. They also represent different stages in the life cycle of an infrastructure asset, where those in the sector have an opportunity through their working lives to do more to change the lives of the communities the infrastructure is designed to serve. There are a number of threads to our campaign. First, the tiles we've been posting, and we'll continue to post for another week or so, to our social media channels in which members of the sector have told us what they, their organisations are doing in their professional lives and sometimes in their personal lives too, to reimagine infrastructure. Second, we have the co-hosted panel discussion you're now attending, where our facilitator will tease out the views of the panellists on reimagining infrastructure in a way that breaks the bias. And finally, a new thought leadership paper developed in conjunction with our 2022 International Women's Day sponsor, Tonkin and Taylor. Look out for that on their and our social media channels and DMs later today, with an in-person launch to follow soon, as, as soon as we can gather again to discuss its conclusions. I'll now hand over to my co-host, Gray Schaefer of Tonkin and Taylor, to introduce our esteemed panellists. First, though, a little bit about Grace. Grace is the Tonkin and Taylor Strategic Business Development Manager. She's uh, highly qualified with a doctorate from the Auckland University. And funnily enough, I found out the other day um, she worked on a topic around the adoption by road construction companies of environmental sustainable initiatives and the relationship green public procurement has for both um, local councils and organisations like the New Zealand Transport Agency. So ably um, part of this discussion today, commenting on infrastructure. She and I also know each other from our time um, being involved in the Women's Infrastructure Network. Um, so great to have you here today, Grace. So I'd like to just um, hand that over to you now. Koe and Adrian. Uh, ko rangi toto te maunga, ko waitamata te moana, ko Christian toku tane, ko Grace Schaefer toku ingoa, no tamaki makaro aho, no reira, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. The, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, the Tonkin and Taylor Group is really proud to be involved with the Infrastructure Sustainability Commission's initiative for International Women's Day across both Australia and Aotearoa. And I'm delighted to introduce the panel on behalf of Tonkin and Taylor this morning. At Tonkin and Taylor, our purpose is to create and sustain a better world, and we want to be renowned for inspiring sustainable futures. It is for this reason that sustainability is at the very core of our offering, and collectively we are focused on creating a legacy of outstanding value for our clients, the environment, and our communities. While this is an incredibly exciting time to be working in infrastructure, there are challenges for those working within it and those looking to join. There's much that can be done and must that and much that must be done, uh, which is the focus of today's panel on breaking the bias. We've got a really amazing lineup of inspiring panel members. Um, and our very first panelist is Michelle Kennedy. Michelle is trained as a strategic urban and transport planner with a master's of urban planning and a bachelor's of geography and international business. Michelle has had a rather non-linear career path from starting at an attack startup to gaining experience on infrastructure and cities related projects through various public, private and not-for-profit organizations across Auckland, New York, Melbourne, London and Vienna Exchange to Sweden. Quite a different um, time to imagine all that travel pre-COVID. 
Through her social enterprise, Six Generations, and her flagship project, Auckland Climate Festival, she works with climate leaders, a large majority of whom are in the energy, transport, and built environment sectors to raise the ambition for inclusive and just climate action. Michelle is passionate about encouraging and empowering Wahine at all levels to embrace who they are and seeing the sector continue to evolve to represent the diversity and strength of the communities we serve. Our second panelist is Rebecca Pakura Ward, representing the infrastructure sector's largest procurer, the New Zealand Transport Agency, Waka Kotahi, where she is the principal sustainability and social specialist. Rebecca holds uh, qualifications in both environmental science and law with 20 years experience leading environmental and social outcomes for major infrastructure projects and programs in the private and public sectors. One of her key roles is leading the Waka Kotahi Sustainability Rating Tools Program. That's both GreenWords and ISC, providing internationally re recognized frameworks for projects to achieve sustainability certifications. She also leads the sustainability and social outcomes for the New Zealand UP program with overarching responsibility for cross-sector integration of environmental, social, community, and Maori outcomes. Um, and finally, well, not finally, but um, our final panelist uh, that I'm delighted to be able to introduce this morning is Dr. Penny Kneebone, um, Tonkin and Taylor's New Zealand Chief Executive. Penny is an environmental scientist who is passionate about bringing together great engineering and science for the work we do in our environment and communities. She provides leadership and oversees performance of Tonkin and Taylor's consulting business in Aotearoa and the Pacific. Penny's background as a STEM graduate and an environmental consultant in the United States in Aotearoa for over 22 years means that she's incredibly passionate about getting more girls into STEM, ensuring Wahina have enduring and satisfying careers, as well as seeing greater representation of the rainbow community in our sector. And finally, facilitating the panel is Paul Evans, who is an independent director passionate about changing how we think about infrastructure. His work focuses on the intersection of housing, transport, and climate change. Paul is a vocal advocate for diversity and inclusion and the huge value it delivers for organizations. I'll now give way to Paul to kick off a really exciting uh, conversation this morning. Thank you. Uh, ina mana, ina reo, e rau ranga tirama, uh, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina tātou katoa. Uh, Morena e te whanau, uh, ko Paul Evans toko ingoa. Uh, welcome along uh, to this International Women's Day panel uh, brought to you by the Infrastructure Sustainability Council whanau. Uh, I'm very privileged to be your facilitator this morning. Uh, very much looking forward to hearing and learning a lot from the incredible wahini toa that we have on our panel. Uh, all these wahini are hugely influential and successful in their mahi within the infrastructure sector here in Aotearoa. Uh, so I'm uh, really looking forward to some knowledge bombs being dropped today. Um, so there's just one more thing that I'd like to share before we actually dive into the discussion itself. Uh, and that's a little whakatauki, which I think speaks to the importance of, of, our, of our discussion today. And that is, ki uh, te kai a te rangatira, he korero, he korero, he korero. Uh, and that means, what is the food of the leader? Uh, it is knowledge, it is communication. And I look forward to lots of mind food, lots of kai to come out of this korero today. So, uh, right, let's get on into things. So, welcome along, everyone. Um, thank you to our panel. Now, the theme for International Women's Day this year is uh, break the bias. Uh, and there's so many ways that we can actually explore that through an infrastructure lens. Um, and I thought we could kick things off um, and warm up by asking all of our panelists to share an example where they've seen the bias broken uh, within their infrastructure career. So, I might throw this one first of all to you, Penny. Sure, thanks Paul and Morena everyone. Um, yeah, look, I think there's two things I've seen in my career which have been great changes. Um, and it's probably a change in how, really basic stuff, change in how we advertise our roles, our role descriptions, our job ads. You know, we're, we, um, 
if we if we can see that a role can be done in reduced hours, we say that. If we um, know that it doesn't require an impossible long list of things for this person to be able to do to do a job, we give a short list of things. We know how women and re most women and most men react differently to those things. And those are two changes that I've seen happen quite tangibly, quite intentionally, that have changed the type of applicants we get for some of the senior roles that we're getting. So that's one thing that I think is a real positive step forward. Awesome, thanks Penny. Uh, how about you, Rebecca? Uh, kia ora. Um, I, I think it has been um, really embracing flexible working arrangements. When I first started my career, which is well over 20 years ago, there was this perception that you had to be at your desk from sort of 8.30 to 5 to be seen to be focused on your career, to be seen to be productive. And um, fortunately, those things have changed. And it's great that now we can, you know, we can, I guess, work our, our careers around other really important aspects of our life, whether it's children, um, working in the community, uh, sports, all these sorts of things. So flexible working arrangements really been the, the key thing for me. Fantastic. And how about you, Michelle? Um, mine is probably more around um, seeing a woman in senior leadership positions. So um, when I was in um, London, working for a consultancy over there, um, a lot of the senior leaders, the global transport leader, the integrated city planning leader, the urban design leader, international development, um, I worked for a, um, an engineering and design consultancy, so it did have quite varied positions, um, but they were all, um, well, a large majority of them were, were women, so um, being able to actually see women in leadership um, was quite a big thing for me. Yeah, that's, um, that's, there's that maxim, you can't be what you can't see. So that visible leadership is a really critical one. Um, and look, something that's changed a lot, and Penny's a great example of that as, uh, you know, chief executive of one of Aotearoa's largest consulting engineering firms. So um, great to see uh, people like you leading the way. Right, let's, let's kick into a bit of a meaty one, right? Is women have outperformed men, and I say this begrudgingly as a man, at every level of education in Aotearoa, for about the last 50 years. Um, yet in our sector, they're still drastically uh, underrepresented and particularly in technical disciplines. You know, I've seen data out of ACE New Zealand, which says at a technical level, only 25% of our employees are, are women. Um, why do you think there's this mismatch? And I might kind of start with you, uh, Michelle, because you talked about how you've, you've seen that change. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, when I reflect on what the industry kind of looked like before I went into university, um, I think my perception of the industry was um, of it being kind of a, a man's world. Um, and a lot of my friends at the time were, um, particularly in engineering and kind of the transport world, were, um, were men or males. Um, so I think there is still a little bit of that going on. Um, to be frank, <laughs> um, despite the fact there are really um, wonderful women that are also in the industry, I think um, the way in which um, it's perceived and indeed some of the ways that the industry works um, can be kind of biased towards um, men still. So, um, and I think one of the other things I was, I was reflecting on is um, the, I think a lot of the way that it's sold um, is kind of quite the hard aspects of what it delivers. So assets and um, roads and bridges and things like that. Um, whereas I wonder if more people are actually interested in being in the industry um, for the wider benefits that infrastructure um, in the broader sense can actually bring. And I, I think that is probably what will attract more people and more women kind of into the industry rather than perhaps those kind of harder outputs um yeah great great answer and you're stealing one of my questions from later right. on in the panel but, <laughs> I'll, but I'll, I'll forgive i'll forgive you for that uh, rebecca any thoughts from your side oh look i completely agree with what um, michelle was saying you know i think traditionally engineering and the associated professions um uh, has always been about physics and maths and it's been about form rather than about function and the important role that infrastructure plays in our lives and 
And I see a real evolution where infrastructure now, you know, the benefits of infrastructure to society, it's not just about concrete and steel, it's about what this concrete and steel and, um, you know, looking at uh, environmental solutions and all of these things can do to better society. And I think if there was a, you know, an opportunity to rebrand and refresh what infrastructure was, I think we'd be able to attract a lot more people, um, a lot more diverse set of people into the industry because it is much more than concrete and steel. Cool. And finally to you, Penny. Yeah, look, I agree um, that I think um, might throw a, a different um, element in there though, Paul, to your question about how we keep people keep people in the industry and I think um, I think there there is that um, can't be what you can't see thing and I know that that grates for some people as being a little unimaginative but I think it is really recognizing that um, the, the importance of that visible future stuff and that seeing a really clear future for yourself um, makes it easier to easier to ride those mid-career waves you know the I think that middle stage in people's career is really tough in an infrastructure career no matter you know uh, men women gender diverse it's tough for everybody but I think the big difference is for a really long time um, the future that's on the other side of that really tough space has been um, much more visible and much clearer and much more tangible for some types of men. And um, I think changing that visible futures and changing the culture is going to be important for getting more people to see a glimpse of themselves in that future and how they might fit in. And that might just keep them hanging in there through those really tough times. And definitely how we talk about infrastructure and what we value in it is going to be part of that too. But look, I think that's, um, I, I really believe that's part of our responsibility as leaders in this industry to really accelerate that change um, to, to improve those visible futures for people. Fantastic. Now it's just kind of um, carrying on from that. You know, there's been so much talk of labour shortages, right? We've had a whole lot of stimulus into the infrastructure sector in Aotearoa in the wake of COVID. That's put pressures on things. We haven't been able to bring people in from overseas. Um, so we've got a really tight labour market. Um, and that's causing real challenges. But at the same time, over the last couple of decades, we've seen a lot of women come into our sector only to leave mid-career, kind of as you, you talk to there, Penny. Um, why do you think so many women do leave at that mid-career point? Um, what can we do to, to, to stop that or to um, how, how can we attract them back into our sector? So I might start with you this time, Rebecca. Oh, okay. Um, well, I can probably talk from my own experience, but um, as a mother, um, and I started my career as a single parent, and it was very, very difficult um, as a single parent sort of trying to fit in with this structure that was based on nine to five, you know, um, you're a professional, that's what needs to be your focus. And when you have children, you know, it's, of course, life's not like that. And so I think that there are still some real barriers to, um, for women um, in their career, particularly, you know, if there are children or if, um, you know, you may have elderly parents, um, you know, extended family commitments to, to, to find that balance and to have the space and the license to be able to participate in many worlds. So it's your career, but there's also a big world out there that we, we contribute to. And it's having that, that recognized and acknowledged and embraced by your employer that it's not just about the, the time you spend in the office that's important and makes you important as a person. So I'll hand over to the others because I'm sure there's lots more to be said in that one. Penny, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I'll pick up on the um, encouraging them back thing. I probably spoke about the visible future stuff that's important to me. But in terms of that, um, that encouraging people back, I think, yeah, Rebecca, absolutely, that thinking about what we can do with flexible working now, let's grab the silver lining out of this weird experience we've had the last couple of years and um, work with the, our ways of doing flexible working. And I think those um, reduced hours roles are probably critical. Um, you know, prof in professional services, right, a, co a consultant is typically working on a bunch of different projects at any one time. You, you're never full time on any one thing. We're all juggling lots of stuff at any one time. So in that regard, a reduced hours role that is focusing on a couple of those things, it seems perfect for our industry. And it, um, it just feels like that might be the really powerful stepping stone we've got to help us really accelerate to a change. Yeah. And to you, Michelle. 
Yeah, those are uh, really good points. Um, I so I guess I'm at a slightly different stage in my career where I'm I'm in my uh, early to mid thirties. I don't have children. Um, I'm not married, but I would like you know I would like to have children and everything like that. And looking forward, <laughs> um, a lot of the women that I have seen in senior leadership positions and and people, um, not even women, but men as well. I see there being quite a lot of stress involved in, in those roles and like burnout and that sort of thing. Um, and I just wonder whether there's, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to, um, to see women, not only women in, in positions of leadership, but those that are actually able to participate in life, like, like you were saying, Rebecca and Penny. Um, so yeah, there's something around that too for me, um, that it's it's not only women, but women who are, yeah, who are able, like who are actually flourishing and, um, you know, being seen to really enjoy their jobs and and all of that um, and maintain um, maintain that, that good balance in other areas of life. And I think that will go a really long way. Yeah, that's a, look, that's a really interesting one. And I think it kind of speaks to particularly say the consulting sector, the metrics that we actually use to measure success, right? As if we look at utilization and billable hours, they are going to uh, advantage people who don't have a life and are willing to sacrifice a whole bunch of things. And, and so it's going, you know, I'm not naive, naive enough to suggest that those metrics won't exist but it's actually looking at a broader suite of metrics and how we measure things in a more kind of joined up and comprehensive way so that we don't disadvantage some incredibly talented people right from, uh, right from the outset. So I'm gonna pick up on a little bit of a point that you made earlier, Michelle, is that too often I think we think of infrastructure as, as concrete and pipes, right? I wanna build a really cool bridge. Uh, when actually at its heart, infrastructure is about delivering outcomes for our communities. Um, so, you know, do we need to change the way we think and talk about infrastructure uh, to make it more appealing to a broader cohort of people? Um, and how do we do that? So you're the one that mentioned it, Michelle, so you can lead us off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I definitely think so. Um, I think for me, one of the things that did attract me, so, so my background, for those of you who don't know, is in um, urban and transport planning. So I come at it from more of a planning lens, but I have worked in, um, in engineering, planning and design consultancy um, in, in my previous job. Um, but for me, what attracted me into planning and as such infrastructure, infrastructure world um, was uh, the notion that what we do, what we plan for, what we build really does underpin the, um, the health and the functioning of a flourishing society. Um, and that you know, the decisions that we make really do, um, you know, they matter just as much as healthcare and education, all of that. Um, they make people, you know, they allow people to be able to move around the city and um, to see their friends and family and to access um, healthcare and, and all these important things. So for me, it's it's kind of about continuing to tell that story and perhaps that story is, is told a bit better in planning, I'm not sure. And maybe it needs to be, you know, maybe there could be some learnings that could be transferred across um, into the engineering space. Um, but yeah, just kind of valuing those community outcomes and the environmental outcomes and things like you said, Paul, um, through the education, I think. I, need, I think it needs to start um, at the school, oh, school and university um, time when people are learning about those careers in particular. And can you build on that for us, Penny? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree a thousand percent. And look, we've got um, a, a similar desire to, to, to want all of our people at TNT of wanting, you know, meaningful work, wanting to be working on things that are supporting their communities and that they can engage with. And I think that when we open up that conversation, and it, you're right, um, that Michelle, it does happen earlier in the planning area, and it, it's probably that consultation and those sort of stages, if we broaden that out and actually get that really happening within our, all of our engineering, that's when we have the opportunity to hear um, different perspectives and get that different input. And when that starts happening, you start to get the, the really awesome outcomes. Um, we have a, our, our, our vision for 2025 is about re being renowned for inspiring sustainable futures, which really speaks to me because I think that's where we, what we need to be thinking about to get our, our people engaged and our communities engaged and be working 
together with them rather than um, doing things to each other. <laughs> so yeah, I think there's a there's a there's a huge amount of potential in um, opening up that that the way we talk about infrastructure, getting more people to participate in the way we talk about it, just because of what we're talking about, and um, yeah, ultimately we'll get much much better outcomes. And Rebecca. Well, you two ladies have just given me, um, reminded me of a, a time when um, I was working on um, a project in um, Mangari. It was actually the old Mangari Bridge replacement project. And part of our work was working with the local schools to get their input. And I remember um, one of the things we need to do was explain what our jobs were. And um, I was a consultant at that stage and I was trying to explain what it was to be sort of a, in, in the transport infrastructure world. And one of the, must have been a, a, a young boy, he would have been about eight. And he said to me, so what you do building roads and transport things, he said, you're like the, you, you're like the veins of New Zealand. The roads are, and, and the railways and the cycleways are like the veins and the veins carry the, 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 it's like the blood and the oxygen to the heart and the brains. And they're like the cars and the trucks and the motorbikes and the people. And I thought, wow, what a clever concept, sort of almost bringing infrastructure to life by using an analogy like, you know, the human body. And, you know, and I learned from this young young person as to, you know, actually explaining what infrastructure meant to, to him. And I think going out to the schools and working with our, with our rangatahi is, is really, really important because they bring us whole new perspective into what infrastructure is and you know in the eyes they were so excited about what we were doing and it was just great and I sort of thought well this is the future generation maybe you know we've just played a small part in hopefully encouraging them mm. into the profession by um, you know uh, getting out there and, and talking about what we do and getting their perspectives as to what we do and what's important to them. I, um, I hope you took his name and we can look him up in a few years' time and, and perhaps give him a job as a communications and engagement professional to, to tell our stories more effectively. Hey, I'm going to stay with you, Rebecca, kind of build on that theme. Is I think there's a real risk that if our organisations don't look like the communities that they serve, that you know there's, there's a really big risk that we won't deliver the right outcomes and perhaps we'll even deliver inequitable outcomes. And I'll kind of, I'll personally reflect on this here, right? If I think about the transport sector, um, a, lot of, a lot of people as engineers in the transport sector kind of look a bit like me, like the middle-aged men. Um, and I remember I went along to a women in urbanism event and they were talking about women's use of public transport and how it differed from men's and around things like perceptions of safety. And I had my eyes opened up to all of these things that I was absolutely ignorant to. Not, not willfully so, but just ignorant because I didn't have that lived experience. And I realized that I had this massive blind spot. Um, so have you seen any examples of that where there's a real mismatch between how we're trying to deliver things and with communities and looking back how we might do that differently or more effectively? Well, I guess if you go back many years, like back to the 1960s, when, you know, there were motorways cutting through swathes of communities, um, you just only need to look at the Northwestern Motorway, how basically it separated Kingsland from, from Grey Lynn. And talking to my mother, she used to say, you know, back in the old days, they had what was called the Kingsland Dip, and you'd get on your tricycle or your bike, and you'd go down, and you'd go down and back up because there was no motorway there. And she said the communities between, you know, Kingsland and Grayland, they were one community, but in came the motorway and completely severed those, those communities into two. Um, you know, back then the community didn't have a voice, but, you know, if we were to do something similar today, we would be engaging with our communities to find out what's important to them. You know, even asking the question, is it appropriate to be locating infrastructure, you know, in a way that, will have such a major impact on the community. Are there other ways of doing it, like putting it underground, for example? So, you know, I feel that we've moved a long, long way since the 60s. But even today, we're still seeing examples of where, you know, uh, sacred sites or, um, you know, rich areas of, you know, biodiversity are still under threat through infrastructure. And it's really important that we engage with communities, with Māori, um, you know, and, and really understand what's important and how we can design infrastructure in a way that um, really can improve outcomes rather than, um, you know, create uh, damage and, and, and major impact. Fantastic. 
Um, and on to you, Penny. Yeah, look, I agree that that legacy that we've inherited of um, there's a huge amount of transport infrastructure that's being designed for a particular scenario of the nine to five, you know, workday with the A to B commute, and um, you know, we've we've. I guess catered really well to one demographic that does one type of travel, but it's um, now recognizing that. And, 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 and you know, that, having said that, that's based on the data that we had available at the time to do that. So it, it made sense at the time. But, you know, we're, um, I, I guess if we are able to start collecting more gender disaggregated data, um, and, and we know that that tells us that those travel patterns are different for women, that there's more complex travel between suburbs, multiple stops, not quite such linear, tra linear um, A to B to the CBD, down at nine, home at five kind of thing. Um, so I think if we can start to, as we start to get better at collecting those data and we can start using those data, then there are huge, um, there is huge potential for creating things that um, really enable that complexity, because it is complex. It's easier to design for the simple stuff. It's the, it's the complex stuff, though, if you can find the solution to that, and you need lots of brains and lots of minds to do that. If you can find the solutions to the complex stuff, that's where we'll get some really fantastic gains, I think. Yeah, get awesome. the tricycles back. <laughs> I was like, if anyone follows me on, on LinkedIn, uh, they'll they'll know not tricycles, but it's skateboards in my household. So my two daughters were, were out, out down the street uh, on, on skateboards. So, um, hey, so over to you, Michelle, have you got any, any um, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I guess just um, picking up on what both of you have said, actually, for me, it is, um, I think taking like a really integrated approach to infrastructure. So Rebecca mentioned, you know, think about the sustainable, the, the environmental impacts, for example, you know, just making sure that um, engineers work with ecologists and, um, and other disciplines um, so that those approaches that we, that we do take um, are really well-rounded um, and inclusive in that way. Um, and also I think, um, picking up on what you've said, Penny, as well, I think, we, there is so much room to be way more sophisticated in the way that we work, um, you know, such as with the data that we collect. And beyond that, I think we need to be really courageous with how we then use that data and the decisions that are made on the back of that. I think um, particularly, I don't know, I don't want to be, you know, <laughs> bring the politics into it, but I think that, you know, there has been a bit of a um, fear around um, kind of making those decisions that are more community led for fear of, um, you know, what will be, what will happen in, in the politics space. You know, a lot of what we do is, it can be quite politicized. Um, but yeah, I really hope that there are people that are in positions of leadership and that are coming through that are willing to um, be courageous and bold around actually using that great information and data that we can get now and um, and deciding to do things differently. Courageous and bold, I like that one. So that's a challenge to all of you to go back to your organizations and be courageous and bold, or even more courageous and bold. Um, so Penny, I've got a question for you, is oftentimes when people, and, and this is because you, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, is oftentimes when we talk about changing the makeup of our firms to be more reflective of our communities, People always kind of go, oh, but the talent pipeline, you know, we've got, to, we've got to get young women into STEM when they're four years of age and it's going to take 20 years to change that. And I guess that response frustrates me a little because it kind of pushes us out into the future rather than kind of um, taking that mantle now and making change now. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you've started to think a little bit differently about the people you hire, um, how you advertise those roles, how you mitigate things like unconscious bias and the like. Yeah, sure. Well, um, yeah, it, it, it's frustrating to me too that 20-year <laughs> thing is, they, they, we're not waiting that long. Um, look, there are lots of things we're doing. I guess I'll probably speak to um, three of them. Um, one is, um, you know, I do think we definitely in, have in the past introduced a bias in those long lists of attributes that candidates must meet. Um, you know, we, we know science tells us that, that women and most women, most men respond differently to those lists. And yet we have kept doing it long after we knew that to be a fact. <laughs> so I think um, 
that's a real challenge to all employers to really think, okay, what do you actually need for this role? And and then be very careful to say some of these other things might be useful, but they are not required. We know that it won't take many things on that list for a woman to decide, for many women to decide, no, that's not for me. Um, whereas um, for many of our men will spot a couple of things and think, yep, that's for me. And both of those are valid re responses, but they do lead to a bias in who we get applying for our jobs. Um, so that's one thing. I, I do think there's a... Um, something in New Zealand we need to watch for which is our kind of shoulder tapping culture and again I think it's come it's really well intentioned it's coming from a place of hey I know somebody who could do this job really well it'll be you know be good for your organization where you go but it is um, it, so it is really well intentioned but it is inherently limiting to those that aren't part of that pool so I think we have to really watch ourselves on that one when that occur, arises and um Look, I, I think the other thing that we can do, that we can, can do more of, is to get diversity. Be bold, be courageous, and get diversity right there in the criteria for these roles that we're advertising and for these positions we're looking for. Um, you know, if, if things between candidates, if all other things are equal in a pool of candidates, then we should be comfortable and we, we, we can and we should actually recognise that adding to the diversity of a mix of people is a really important thing to do and we should be, be bold and courageous and confident to do that. Um, it should be a totally valid reason to get somebody over the line. So those are probably the three things that I think we can tackle quickly and effectively. Fantastic. Thanks, Penny. And to you, Michelle. Yeah, I think... Um... There's a really big opportunity to actually nurture people within their roles as well um, and, um, you know, actually provide opportunities within the workplace to grow and to develop those skills that perhaps you, you know you want. Um, but yeah, to take, to take that leap with someone um, and actually trust that they're going to want to learn and want to grow in the role. They don't need to have everything at the beginning necessarily. Um, and I think there's so many different ways that that can be built into the structure, the operations of businesses. So um, giving opportunities, say for women or, or it doesn't even need to be women, but other people that um, can be um, typically underrepresentative, underrep underrepresented, sorry. Um, so, you know, giving shadowing opportunities, for example, um, and recognizing that perhaps their billable hours that week might be less than they would ordinarily, you know, to, to make way for those sorts of things. I, I think there are lots of different tools that we can um, that we can introduce or use more within workplaces to um, make women and others, you know, give the opportunity for them without them feeling bad or guilty for underperforming in other areas. Cool. Mm. And Rebecca, I'd love a public sector perspective on this. Well, I sort of feel like we're moving towards much more of a melting pot of skill sets and capabilities within Waka Kotahi. And I think much of that is driven by um, the direction that government is um, sending us around, you know, what is important to government, you know, it's around climate change, it's about sustainability, of course, it's about safety and, and having, you know, good, strong, resilient infrastructure. And, and it's about engaging and working with our communities and partnering with, with Māori as well. And all of those things bring a whole range of skill sets that are not necessarily that quantitative linear skill set, which is important. The maths and physics, believe me, they are important. I'm hopeless at it, but really, really important for infrastructure. But equally so, those qualitative skill sets, the social sciences, Matauranga Māori, uh, te reo, all of these uh, comms and engagement, all of these skill sets are now vitally important in, in, in planning and designing and delivering what I call good infrastructure, infrastructure that's going to be enduring, it's going to be intergenerational. So, um, you know, within Waka Kotahi, we have, you know, we are looking for a range of people that can provide those perspectives and those skill sets into the work we do. So it's, I feel like we're really progressive and, you know, and of course there's more work to be done, but we, you know, it, it is changing. Yeah, look, I think it's a great point that there's always more work to be done, right? As I'm like, I'm sure we are doing things now which we're doing very genuinely and think are great. And in 20 years time, we'll probably look back on them and go, God, we, we shouldn't have done that. But we're, we've got a trajectory, we're moving forward. Um, and we're, 
we're doing some great things and it is great to see that um, that guidance coming from government around procurement and those sorts of levers that influence the things that we do within our businesses. Um, so Penny, I'm gonna give this one to you. Look, so often we see um, raising children being mentioned as, as to the, the reason why women leave and that we don't see women carry through into those senior roles. So I'm posing this to you because you're a woman in one of these senior roles. Um, so speaking for myself, it's probably time that our men stepped up and shared that load a little bit more because um, lots of men are, but there's still seemingly, seemingly this um, inequity and expectation in broader society. So what do you think organisations can do to encourage our men to play a more active role? Yeah, I think um, there's, there's definitely a part in the equal sharing of parental leave. We can be encouraging that to happen. Um, I think encouraging our, our male leaders to be more loud about the non-work commitments that they are working around and working with, I think that's an important part of it too. I think a lot of that is, a lot more of that is happening than we hear about probably. There's often other reasons given for why people aren't doing a particular thing, but it's actually being loud and proud about that is important. But look, I think um, I'm interested to hear what Michelle and, and Rebecca have to say on this too, but I, I do think there's another part in this that with women leaving the workforce and then having that reevaluation of what that means. You know, we've seen this recently with a whole lot of people around the world reevaluating their lives as a result of different working environments with, you know, this great resignation and, and perhaps thinking, hey, maybe my life, this is, there's, there's other things in my life that I value and I don't want so much of my life to be around my job and my work. I'm, I'm not sure that could be part of it too. And that's why I think some of these other options where Work can be part of a healthy life and a balanced life, and a, and um, are, are now at our disposal much more than they ever have been before, and we should be be using those as well. So, so yes, getting our men to be more vocal about the non the 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 family commitments that they're looking towards, but also providing options for different types of options for women to be able to bring into the workforce should they choose to. Awesome. And I love that concept of, of leaving loudly, letting people know why you're doing these things. Um, so we'll go to you now, Michelle. So you talked about this look to the future of the role, you, you know, oh, God, that looks really stressful, um, kind of build, building on from what, um, what, what Penny was saying. Um, what would you like to see? Yeah, well, um, what you described, Penny, is... is um... I mean, that would be fantastic if that's what the, if that is what is available for people. I think my friends that have gone um, on to have kids and have stepped away um, recently and are thinking about getting back into it, for them, I've heard um, there's, a, there's a bit around confidence. So feeling like they have, um, that they might be kind of, yeah, lagging behind a bit now, not kind of keeping up their networks or their connections with people or um, the knowledge that they need, perhaps. Um, I don't really know, yeah, I don't know exactly what it stems from, but that's the sorts of things that I've heard. Um, so yeah, perhaps there's something around that too, in terms of actually um, communicating to women that even if they, they do have a period of time off, um, they, might, they're a, they still are really valuable, um, they can come back at the same level or higher than they were before, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, and they can potentially come back in a more transitory um, role, so part-time. I think having those, that, that flexible working will definitely go a really long way. Mm. Kia ora. Um, hey, Rebecca, I remember you saying earlier when you started in the infrastructure sector, you know, you were a single parent. So what would have, what would have really made a difference for you back then? Um, back then, I actually had a couple of false starts where it was very, very difficult to get the flexibility and to be able to work part time. And I was actually um, told that in, if I was to remain part time, it would be very difficult to become an associate or a partner in a particular organisation. Um, fortunately, I was able to um, work for an organisation that was incredibly progressive and um, I was made a partner um, even though I was part time and that was quite um, new for that would have been at least 15 probably 20 years ago now 
And, um, and it worked because the, the organization would value quality over quantity. It didn't matter how many hours you worked. It was how you contributed and what value you brought to the, um, to the organization that was important. So I think it's that, it's that um, being brave. I think we've used that word before. It's about being courageous and brave and testing and trialing new ways and, and seeing how it works. And if it works, we'll keep doing it. You know, we don't have to be stuck in the, in the you know, what we were doing 20, 50 years ago. So it's, it's, it's all about that. And I think flexibility is really, really important and having that um, ability to, to participate in all aspects of your life in a meaningful way without feeling like you need to, you know, potentially burn out. So that's what's kept me in the profession. It's, it's having a progressive employer and leadership. Now we've, um, we've talked a lot about diversity today right and, and diversity is really really um important but simply making our organizations more diverse isn't enough like we can go out and we can hire a whole bunch of women or maori or pacifica or people from our rainbow whanau um, but if we aren't inclusive they'll probably just leave you know they'll be the resilient ones who stick it out so how can we ensure that our organizations are being more inclusive so i'd love to start with you on this one michelle um i think it comes back again to the way that we um that we actually go about our work so the um and the outcomes that we seek from our projects i think if we if we value um outcomes that need the inputs from the staff that we're hiring then you know then I think that will help with um, people feeling more included as well, you know, where they're actually, they're feeling more purpose and value in the work that they're contributing to um, and where it's not, in, you know, done in a tokenistic kind of way. Um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest ones for me that I've noticed. Um, but yeah, I'll hand it over to to Penny or Rebecca? <laughs> well, Penny, I know uh, Tonkin and Taylor have been doing a lot of work in the um, uh, diversity and inclusion space, and you've got Talia in leading that work now. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, look, there's um, a huge amount of things we can be doing, a huge amount of things we are doing, and definitely some things we're finding that are working. But I think in terms of making a workplace more inclusive, um, it starts with really, I think, listening and adapting, and there's a big element of coaching and there's a big element of, of learning from those you are trying to coach. So it's it's adapting our environment to be more um, able to, to, to <laughs> this sounds very self-centered, but to be able to benefit from the awesomeness of having a whole lot of different people working with us and working really well with us and feeling comfortable doing that. Um, we've had a bit of a discussion recently about um, networking, for example, and the way we do networking, which can be just a hideous term to a lot of people and just, Ugh, you know, it sounds just like it makes your skin crawl. But, you know, that those connections and are, are really important in the work that we do um, for, for, for getting work and for having your peer group assembled around you and um, that you can draw on. And I think it's about helping people understand that there's many more ways than one to do that, you know, and um, you know, for, for, for women, it might be finding a way that's comfortable to do that, that is actually fun and enjoyable, something you're going to want to do. And in terms of, um, you know, we've, we've uh, encouraging different things to happen, small groups, small groups getting together, um, ways that ways that enable people to be themselves, basically. And look, that really extends into what we can do in our workplace to make our workplaces more um, inclusive for um, our, our um, Maori and, uh, grads and interns and Pacifica grads and interns and, and, and staff and really trying to understand what is it we can shift and do differently in the way our, our basic fundamental being there forever kind of structures that they're actually getting in the way of that inclusion and um, it is hard to see those things unless you have have people there to tell you and you're willing to listen and to change stuff but it can happen and um, we can do it I think hopefully we can do it better more quickly and better <laughs> yeah well good and Rebecca would uh, love to hear from you now oh um well in Waka Katahi um I I guess we're looking to embed inclusiveness in everything we do. We have a um, it's sort of like a, a, a tikanga, our, our culture, organizational culture talk called um, Te Kāpehu, which is, um, embodies um, respect, 
collaboration, um, inclusiveness, um, trust, and all of these values that we're expected to embody in the way we work. And so um, if, if we don't work like that, we need to be brave and call it out. And if we do work like that, we need to celebrate it. And we, you know, this is quite, um, this was introduced a couple of years ago. So we're all sort of getting on board with it. And it's becoming integral to the way we, we interact with one another internally, but also how we need to be interacting externally as well. So it's becoming part of us, inclusivity. And it's, and it's really important that we provide the support and the platform so that we are, we are set up for success in that space. So it's evolving and I feel like we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. Awesome. And I love that you just know off the top of your head your organisational values. That's awesome because that really says to me that your organisation is living those. So mm -hmm. that's great. Hey, now we're, um, we're coming towards the end of our panels. We've got a couple of um, questions to go. Um, and so I'll ask you to be some kind of rapid fire questions a little bit shorter in terms of your answers i want to be a little bit controversial here is let's talk about targets and quotas right um, in any part of our business if we want to achieve something we'll put a target in place uh, yet so often when we talk about targets or quotas with diversity uh, there's this massive version right people freak out about it um, so why why do you think that is and do targets have a role to play Penny, I'm going to throw to you first. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And look, I think, yeah, totally all about the data and the targets. And I do think some of us have been on the receiving end of targets that have felt, you know, <laughs> awkward at different times in our careers. But look, I think probably getting the right target is the most critical thing here. And, um, and perhaps what might be more important even underlying that are the essential criteria that sit behind it. You know, I, I kind of wonder if, so much, if, if our industry bias isn't so much against women and the International Women's Day we're talking about here today, um, as it is perhaps biased against seeing the, the value of the qualities that, uh, that come more often with women. <laughs> um, things like um, vulnerability and curiosity and compassion and consultation and, and, and that comfort with complexity. And I think if we, can, if we can really shift to making some of those things sit really firmly in the criteria that we, um, that we are using to make hiring and team forming and um, opportunity choices, then I think we'll, we'll get there much more quickly. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Great answer, Penny. I love that one. And you've made me think about it differently. Michelle, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I love that. I have written that down, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making some great notes here, guys. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really amazing one, actually, um, because I agree. I think that uh, women, you know, typically do bring those qualities, like you mentioned, of, of nurturing and and. And I think speaking to your point, Rebecca, before, which I really appreciate in terms of the principles and values, if we if there's a kind of connection between having really strong and solid principles and values that um, our organizations um, really live out, then that should kind of naturally flow through to the criteria that we set for everyone. Um, so I think, yeah, having the marrying of the two, um, I see lots of opportunities there. So. Yeah, in terms of quotas, um, I'm, I'm not really in, in the same position in terms of leading large organizations. I know for what I'm doing with, um, with the festival, I personally am setting targets for myself um, for um, the establishment of our board and um, the participation of people within the festival and things like that more as a guide and a benchmark, um, but it sits alongside other um more like qualitative outcomes as well so for me I'm looking at it in the context of a whole as opposed to just focusing on it as a you know um and it, it is to you know help me keep to account and think broadly um and really challenge my thinking around um how I'm kind of getting things established and going about the way that I work and Rebecca what, what are your thoughts on this one Oh, it's a pretty tricky one because it's that whole adage, you treasure what you measure. And, you know, Waka Kotahi, we've introduced targets for, for embodied carbon reduction. Uh, we've also introduced carb, uh, 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 targets for um, uh, 
uh, working with our local businesses, Māori enterprises, so there's some very clear um, uh, guidance and, and targets around th in those areas. So I think when it comes to, um, to people and um, recruitment, um, procurement, you know, we're, we're watching this space really, really carefully and, and seeing what our um, external, our, our external parties are doing, our suppliers, and obviously our crown partners as well. So it's, it's something we've, we've got a really close eye on. Um, awesome. Fantastic. Hey, so as we come to a close, I would like each of you to think about in your career, what's the one thing that would have made the biggest difference to you, you know? Um, so I feel like, I feel bad for whomever I drop this on first because the others get a little bit more time to think. Um, but I'm sorry, Michelle, it's going to go to you first. <laughs> so what's, um, what's, what's, what's the one thing that would have made a real difference for you? I think more value on the... Um the kind of nurturing, uh, the, the aspects that Penny kind of mentioned that I think um, are a large part of who I am. Um, yeah, I think more value on those and less on um, kind of billable time, productivity, um, more of a balance between the two. Fantastic, Rebecca. I think for me, it's technology. If, we, if I had the technology we have um, here and now where I could bring my laptop home and work um, in, at times that suited me better um, or, or could work around childcare and things like that, it would have made a huge difference to me 20 years ago. And Penny? Yeah, I've, I've struggled to think of one, Paul, but I think probably I'll probably just talk to one thing that did make a really big difference to me that I've realised recently and thinking about these types of things. Um, and that I was lucky enough to have a perhaps similar experience to Michelle and that I graduated in, 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 when I was living in California into a super hot employment market. So you could take your pick of jobs pretty much, which was a bit of a luxury. And I, I feel very, very fortunate to have been in that position. But look, I chose that first job based on um, the the five senior women that interviewed me in my job interview and um, it was probably the first career choice I made and it was by far and away the best one I've ever made it was I didn't really realize or appreciate it then um, probably at the time but I think just the the work environment that those women created just by being themselves by getting on being competent professionals doing their thing each in their own different ways just um, made me really feel like I was um, in, in a fish in my own water in a way. <laughs> I just felt um, it, it was a very lucky starting experience. And that's what um, kind of makes me such a, a, a convert to the idea of having visible futures, that you, you need to be able to see how people can operate in different ways that look a little bit like you or could be something that you could do. And I think that's um, that's perhaps more what I think what I'd love to see us be able to do more of and, and create more for more people. Fantastic. And to wrap up our final question, and we're going to go reverse order, so I'm going to drop this one on you, Penny, sorry, mm -hmm. is what's your challenge to our audience? You know, if there's one thing they could focus on, what do you think that should be? Like I, I think it's just jumping in and being part of this change that we're all living in because we are living through a period of change and we're trying to speed that up, um, but we are in a big period of change. We've got to appreciate that. So I think it's it's jumping in and being parting, part of it, focusing on what you can change and doing something with that. And also importantly, I think, being a real quick follower of stuff if you see something that's changing that you like jump in there and give your support to it. I think that's going to be what will help us um, really, really propel ourselves forward. Rebecca, over to you. I think mine's, mine is just be you. Um, be brave and, and, and just follow your own path because everyone's got something to contribute. And finally to you, Michelle. You both stole mine. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that was what I was going to say, actually, was I, I what I have taken from this conversation is, um, and I feel really encouraged by, um, is um, the permission to, for us to just be ourselves and be women in the workplace. And I think if um, uh, my encouragement, whether it's to um, a woman or a man, 
or someone from the, you know, from the, representing the rainbow community is to, um, is to support other women to be themselves too. You know, I've had opportunities that have been given to me by men and I've had really amazing men lift me up and push me forward for opportunities. And that's gone such a long way. Um, and I think equally, there's so many opportunities for women to support other women and build each other up and build each other's confidence in just being who we are. So, yeah, so I, I kind of mirror um, what Penny and Rebecca have said too. <laughs> um, I absolutely took with that point to, to be yourselves. I think I was reflecting on this. I was talking to um, a, a woman colleague the other day, and she said so often when she's had training throughout her career, it's tried to tell her to act differently and to be differently and to not be herself rather than actually challenging the construct and saying, no, actually, you're perfectly great as you are and we need to change that environment uh, that you work within. So I guess um, this is an International Women's Day event, but I would say to all the men out there watching it is um, we need to be better allies, right? And the other thing we need to do is we actually need to intentionally make space you know, we can grab onto opportunities and hoard all of those opportunities. And we need to actively think, are we the right people to be doing this? Or could somebody else actually be doing a better job of this? Could somebody take this into, into the future in a new, fresh and exciting way, whether they're a woman, when they're from our Māori, Pacifica or rainbow communities, our disability communities. I think it's incredibly important that we're genuine in, uh, in our embracing of, of diversity and inclusion. So I'd like to say thank you so much to you, Penny. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And thank you to everyone for, for joining us on your, uh, your Tuesday morning to listen into this kōrero. Uh, go well, uh, get out there and uh, bust down those barriers. Thanks, Whānau. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, all. Yeah.